The latest update on the Cross the Ages project dropped on Wednesday, March 13th, 2024. We've got a lot more insight into where this project is headed. From the token listing and land values to the upcoming game, Arise, we're diving into the entire economic model of this project. I'll talk about the token listing and its potential value at the end of this video because the token's value really brings together all the economic aspects of the project we're discussing. First off, for those who aren't yet in the loop, Cross the Ages is a whole narrative, a franchise, intellectual property, a universe, whatever you want to call it. It brings to life the worlds of Artelium, where multiple universe styles coexist. And us geeks, we dig it. You've got the Archontes, a medieval fantasy folk straight out of dungeons and dragons with magic and mythological creatures that are just awesome. The Montries live in a sci-fi world, and then there are the unfortunate souls in the Rift Zone, setting the stage for a post-apocalyptic shadow punk vibe or something like that. The Rift's full story is set to unfold in the card game come June. But from what's hinted at in the book, it's shaping up pretty cool. CTA's initial pitch is about crafting a real universe brought to life by legit artists like W. Lop or Eric Note wielding the brush, all serving a genuine story penned by real deal authors like Alain Damasio or Arno Dolan. If you're wondering who Arno Dolan is, just check out Saint Seiya Odyssey where he's a co-author. I bought it because I know Arno a little bit and I really enjoyed it. And my daughters loved it too, by the way, and if you're looking to dive into the story, the book is already up for pre-order on Amazon. And for a little sneak peek, here's the cover of the Collector's Edition, and you can also catch an interview with the authors over on GA Meta. But this one is in French, so it might be hard to understand unless maybe some of you watching studied French in high school. That covers the lore. Personally, I'm all in because I'm a huge fan of sci-fi and fantasy. Shout out to Asimov and the Foundation series, by the way. So that's the first cornerstone of CTA, the narrative. Now let's move on to what I consider the second pillar, the economy. Mainly because, as everyone knows, I'm into economics and finance. But also because Cross the Ages is aiming to be the first entertainment project that builds a real and substantial economy in a fictional world. To highlight its significance, the economic dimension is flagged as a key component for the project right in the Genesis section of the white paper. The first dimension highlighted for the project is the narrative, which ties into the project's values, and then, bam, right behind it is the economic dimension. So I'm thrilled because in my initial chats with Sammy Klagu, CEO of Cross the Ages, back in September 2022, I quickly realized that this project's team had a pretty intriguing economic vision. And if they could meld that with a fictional universe and video games as the medium to bring it all to life, it could turn out to be super cool. So I went ahead and snagged about 20 Primus packs just in case to see how things would unfold. Back then, they weren't priced what they are today. Speaking of Primus, when I see there are still some for sale on OpenSea for $1,200, let me tell you, if they're still around in 2025, I'm going to snatch them up. But that's a story for another. Why 2025? Simply put, it's about my personal cash flow. If you're wondering why, check out this video on Mint Passes. My opinion hasn't changed one bit. To wrap up this lengthy intro, the project's two pillars, especially through video games. The first is a collectible card game that I'm really bad at and don't quite get, but it has its niche audience. I won't dwell on it too much since the white paper suggests it's going to be revamped for a broader audience. Starting with a niche game was crucial for building a community. Now that it's accomplished, it makes sense to adapt it for a wider audience. So far, it's pretty logical. We'll just have to see how it goes. Beyond the TCG, there's a second game set for late 2024. It's called Arise, which is an action RPG. It's a massive project with gameplay that seems much more straightforward. While the creature images are just concepts at this point, they do give a good sense of, of the direction. From what's been shared, there are currently two gameplay phases planned for early access at the end of 2024. One part is housing, where players can build their base on their land to farm resources. The other phase is dungeons, where you need to take down 
monsters of varying difficulty levels, including a boss at the end, kind of like what you see in World of Warcraft or Destiny. Following that, the roadmap for the coming years indicates that the game will gradually expand, aiming towards a much larger open world. The upcoming guilds or capital update hints at an ever-expanding gameplay variety, as well as the staging of conflicts and the social interactions between players and different factions. So, why am I so thrilled about this white paper, especially considering the card game is set for a revamp and we're waiting to learn more about Arise? First off, the narrative and universe components are exceptionally well-crafted, and that's fundamental. I recommend checking out the book, and I'm particularly excited about the planned 1.5-hour animated movie and series. The second key point is that, in Arise, each player will own their land. However, there will be purely in-game lands and lands that are essentially shares in tokenized power farms. I say essentially, because we need to see how the link between the profits from the power farms and their value will truly unfold with NFTs, which are not financial securities. Nevertheless, this landification of power farms in the worlds of Artelium really excites me to the core because it validates the entire project on an economic level. It's nothing short of being revolutionary. To put it simply, I'm the co-founder of a company called Data Factory, which produces power hosting farms. Data Factory was initiated by Richard Esteve, who is also a co-founder of Cross the Ages alongside Sammy, with the goal of developing the vision they've had from the start with their CTA project to connect the virtual to the real. It's completely insane and visionary if they pull it off. The concept is pretty straightforward. We set up farms like this one with the goal of buying electricity in bulk from energy producers, converting it into usable power for information industries whose business is to consume energy to produce information they value on the internet. Currently, our clients are Bitcoin miners, but we could also serve data centers for AI or video rendering. Basically, we buy electricity, transform it, and sell it while helping to balance the electric grids. This is highly profitable, but only accessible to major investors. When Data Factory raised funds through stock offerings, the minimum investment was $500,000. So, it's not accessible to everyone. For CTA, their approach seems to be buy farms in bulk, then divide them into tiny pieces called lands, run them through their gamer grinder, and finally offer them in their game a rise to create a very real economy in the worlds of Artelium. And all this using only decarbonized energy to have a positive and virtuous impact, but for that, the benchmark consultancy Carbone 4 will give us the real and quantified result of the impact of their approach. They can certainly be trusted to be impartial. Let me put it another way. When you buy land in the game, you'll receive a share of the profits produced by the associated power farms. This return, paid out in dollar CTA, will depend on success criteria within the game. To make sure we're on the same page, as announced, the first CTA farm to be landified, let's say, is a 4 megawatt farm in Oregon. CTA will manage it and sell 99% of the farm shares in the form of lands. We'll have to wait and see how they manage to perform this feat. When this farm starts generating profits from its industrial activities, CTA, as the manager, will receive dollars. The company will take a 10% management fee, and then with the remaining 90%, it will buy CTA tokens on the market to distribute to the landowner's wallets. And that's groundbreaking. It means the CTA economy is underpinned to a very real industrial economy in the real world. This potentially allows Cross the Ages to be a project where one can enter from various points but where all investors or players could potentially come out with more money than they started with since there's an input of real value. We're not dealing with flawed tokenomics where tokens are rewarded with tokens minted on the fly. Now, how does it work? Well, the farm's profitability is broken down into three tiers that secure different levels of return for your land. The first tier is a proof of purchase. As soon as you buy the land, you've secured 50% of the return. Next, the second tier requires active participation. To lock in this tier, you'll have to undertake weekly quests within the games. This method secures an extra 25% of the return. Lastly, the third tier functions as a proof of defense. For the final 25% to be secured, 
Players are required to acquire cards from the Cross the Ages card game and deploy them on their land. Put simply, the initial tier guarantees investor protection under any circumstance. The following tier engages players with the game. Hence, regardless of the game's quality, there will be an incentive for players to participate to safeguard the second tier of their land. And the third tier adds value to the cards sold by the company. From this perspective, you can consider that CTA takes an additional indirect commission beyond the 10% management fee since you're required to buy cards from them to secure your final return. And that's what's brilliant. By gamifying traditional finance, CTA is creating entertainment that pays off because the games are linked to industrial activities that generate wealth. Therefore, it's possible to determine the number of lands required to be sold annually for the project to be profitable, ensuring that, on the whole, players gain more from their involvement than what they invest in the game. According to the white paper, the farm will be marketed as land valued at $2.8 million with an anticipated return of 20%. All right, so 20% of $2.8 million gives us a total land yield of $560,000 per year. Since the first tier covers 50%, this means that even if you're getting rated non-stop, you'll break even after 10 years, assuming the 20% yield stays constant. In finance terms, this is like buying a share of a power farm with a P.E. ratio or price to earnings ratio of 10. Is that good or bad? Well, we can directly compare it to how publicly traded companies in this field are valued. For instance, Marathon Digital trades at a price earning ratio of 14, which is almost 50% more expensive. Riot Platform is running at a loss, so we're not even talking about any sort of return there. Core Scientific was on the brink of bankruptcy, so we're not discussing that either. What we're seeing is that companies involved in power farming have mixed the business of cryptocurrency mining with the infrastructure business of power farms. As a result, it hasn't been wildly successful because they've absorbed all the volatility of Bitcoin during the bear market with Data Factory and therefore with CTA's lands. Only the farm's business is being sold. And here we're talking about infrastructure, so it's much less volatile. That's why, given the current market conditions, a nominal yield of 20% seems reasonable to me. In the long term, we'll see as value and returns will fluctuate with the market, but personally, I'm a believer. I'll be buying lands for which I have a presale ticket thanks to my mint pass, clearly. Some might wonder why especially since I already own a bunch of power farms as a major shareholder of Data Factory. We'll get into that in a bit. So, even if I don't do anything with my land, a 10% yield today is already pretty sweet to have. Therefore, the first point is for investors providing a credible profitability model for them. But it's neutral for the CTA project, aside from the 10% management commission. All right, so the second tier demands that I get into the game. Either I play the land and lock in an additional 25% return, or if I don't, it becomes vulnerable to being raided by other players, thus falling into the third tier. This tier is designed to get people playing the games. If the games are good, it's insane because people will literally get paid to play fun games. Every geek's dream. And if the games aren't great, at the very least, they'll still be played for the return. This second tier acts as a massive marketing edge over any competitors, or at the very least, as a safety net for Cross the Ages, giving them time to improve. Just think about what this means. How many video game companies can guarantee a revenue base even when they flop on an expansion or game? Let's say 50% of the lands are defended. This means $70,000 goes to investors actively playing their lands. And another $70,000 goes back into the pool for the third tier stakes. Keep that number in mind. Now onto the third tier proof of defense. Here, in order to secure the last portion of your return, a landowner needs to buy cards to safeguard their earnings. If they don't fully protect their land, a portion of this return is up for grabs by attacking players who also need cards to launch their attacks. So looking at the bigger picture, the third tier is how Cross the Ages generates revenue by selling cards. For players, this tier backs the value of the cards with real value since they can be used to either raid or protect a portion of the profits from our farm in Oregon. 
For CTA, it doesn't matter who wins between the attackers and defenders since both sides need to purchase cards. The real question is, how much players are willing to pay? Like stocks, how many years of protection or profit are you willing to pay to defend your land? Let's talk numbers. For the third tier, there's $140,000 a year up for grabs for the Oregon farmlands. Let's simplify and say I own all the lands. If I can spend $140,000 on cards to defend $140,000 in dividends, then I'm looking at a 100% profit because I break even at the end of the first year. This means my return on value ratio or PE ratio in finance terms is 1. If I need to spend $280,000 on cards to fully defend my lands at the third tier, my PE ratio jumps to 2 which gives me a 50% return and so on. With this info, we've got all we need to do some great calculations to figure out under what conditions a project becomes net positive, making a fictional universe actually real. Consider CTA's revenue of $10 million last year as revealed in a capital article. Assuming a land offering yields a 20% return, and the value of the cards is backed by half of tier two and 100% of tier 3. Our base calculation is 37.5% of 20%. If we say players want a PE ratio, a return on their card investment of 5, this means to sell $10 million in cards per year, you need $10 million. 5 divided by 0 0.375 divided by 20% yield equals about $26 million in lands per year or two offerings of $13 million each year. That's totally doable. Considering this is about raising money so buyers can make a return, it's much easier than making $10 million in revenue from selling entertainment. This figure seems entirely reachable. Moreover, as time goes on, the project gains credibility, and the PE ratio of the cards will likely increase as the project's risk decreases and player confidence grows, potentially reaching the PE ratios of traditional financial markets in the best case scenario. To put things into context, the P.E. ratio of the U.S. stock market fluctuates between 10 and 20, depending on market cycles. However, one could also speculate that the 20% return might decrease over time as competition enters the market, so let's just say for simplicity's sake that these factors balance each other out. So with these assumptions, CTA becomes a net positive game once it sells about $25 million worth of land for each $10 million revenue bracket. More players mean more land sales for CTA and more land sales mean more players. It's a cycle. This potentially positions Cross the Ages as the first kind of immortal video game studio with a player base that will come, no matter what, to defend their returns. They'll also buy cards for the same reason. I find this feature pretty unique. There's one last point to understand about the lands, and it's an important one. It involves this chart. As I understand it, there seems to be a sort of seniority system with the lands. Essentially, when you buy a level 5 land, you're getting it at a valuation 33% cheaper than a level 3 because you're earning 50% more. Let that sink in for a moment. In other words, a level 3 land, which is at 100%, is a pivot land distributing a 20% return. With a level one land, you don't need to invest much, but your return is lower. While if you invest $50,000, which starts to be a significant amount, your return is increased. Therefore, level five lands yield up to 30% return and level one lands yield up to 10% return. This is consistent with what Richard and Steve mentioned at Heroes Legacy. Also, the white paper points out that the smaller, lower level lands will have advantages in terms of tri-sell production, which is pretty smart. Essentially, the big investors will get their returns in dollar CTA, while the smaller ones can fuel the economy with tri-sell and sell it to the big players who need it for beefing up their defense. It's something to consider, but overall, even a guild like Grand Angle Meta might find value in level 1 and 2 lands. This is great because it means we can raise more funds for each farm beyond what players alone can finance. So, the more investors there are, the more the project moves towards being net positive. It's just insane, really? By the way, the white paper also mentions that a unique card can secure a dungeon at 100%. With this info, I can say that unique cards have a base price equal to the protected value of the third tier of the most expensive land, so level 5, times the PE ratio I'm willing to pay. 
So for a PE of 5, that puts the valuation of a unique card at $19,000 or $9,500 for a PE of 2. Going with a PE of 5, I can say that the share of the value of the Golden Legacy corresponding to the unique card as of now is $7,600 times 5 if I stick with a PE of 5 for the Golden Legacy, which is $38,000. In these conditions, the unique card adds $38,000 of value to the Golden Legacy, plus whatever else. This is where it gets really exciting with CTA because once you have a functioning economy, everything becomes calculable and you can assess your risk level and expected returns. And that's awesome. And the icing on the cake, if the books sell well and the movies are a hit, in short, if the Cross the Ages franchise succeeds, then we'll see a premium on the intrinsic economic profitability that's linked to the value of the franchise. And this is why I'm planning to buy loads of lands in CTA, even though I'm a major shareholder in Data Factory. On one hand, I understand the value of power farms, and from my perspective, I'm totally prepared to buy shares of the Oregon farm at a $2.8 million valuation. But I'm also hopeful that the games will be killer, and the franchise will blow up. In that case, it would be huge, both financially and creatively. Just imagine, in a scenario where everything goes well, We'd have created the first habitable, alien, or virtual world, as you like, where people can earn a living from either labor or capital gains within the worlds of Artelium. Personally, if that happens, I want in. And now we can talk about the token because its listing is just around the corner, scheduled between April 1st and June 30th. At its core, once we have a net positive project, the token becomes the currency of this world making it a pivotal aspect. As you've gathered, the token can be purchased on exchanges or pools, I suppose. But it can also be earned through lands as compensation for the industrial activity of the corresponding farms. This makes it quite intriguing. However, all these mechanisms pertain to the token's flow and not its stock, because all the uses in the game or via the lands don't justify why one would want to hold on to the token over time. The only reason I'd want to keep tokens, or why I'd keep dollars as savings, is because of the interest rate in the case of dollars or SR card airdrops, in the case of tokens. Thus, the value is very much tied to the value of SR cards, as I explained in a video back in June 2023, and I haven't shifted my view even slightly on this because it's just financial logic. Gaming can't change that. Put another way, if you remove the Federal Reserve's benchmark interest rate from the dollar, 90% of dollars worldwide would return to the USA quickly. The same goes for any currency tied to a coherent economy. Now I know in crypto, there are irrational investors doing all sorts of things, but fundamentally I believe time will adjust these people's savings to their true market value, if you catch my drift. But yes, I agree it can take time. However, the team has clearly understood this point since the role of SR cards is emphasized in the white paper. These cards, not named special by accident, will play a crucial role in defending lands to ensure they have real utility. And that's very reassuring for their value because it ties the value of SR cards to the value of lands, hence the farms, making it one of the most desirable assets of the Cross the Ages project and providing a solid foundation for the CTA token. However, I must express a caveat because there seems to be a risky direction being taken and I believe the team will inevitably have to revisit this over time. The acquisition of SR cards is contingent on holding dollar CTA, which is fine, but these tokens also need to be locked in mint passes. And this is where the problem lies. Why? Because mint passes, as I understand it, serve to provide an additional return to early backers of the project and to act as a premium asset that ends up in guilds to professionalize them. In other words, only organizations capable of leveraging the benefits of mint passes and having the necessary capital to purchase them will own them. Mint passes are, in my view, destined to slip from the hands of individual players who will net a nice profit in the process into the hands of guilds. That's great, it's a brilliant idea because to structure a real economy, there's a need for well-structured and well-capitalized businesses. 
However, you're beginning to see the long-term issue, making mint pass ownership, a condition for token yield, in essence, potentially monopolizes the token's yield to a few entities since the number of mint passes is limited, whereas the number of players is not. In fact, I believe the team has sensed this issue, consciously or subconsciously, because there are two systems planned for accessing SR cards. One is the current system with mint passes, and the other is a so-called dynamic pool system. Here's what I gather. A portion of the SRs will be obtainable via mint passes, and the remainder could be accessed through another system, bypassing the mint pass constraint. However, when a problem is addressed with bifurcated solutions, it often indicates a misidentified issue. I see several challenges to tackle. The desire to add value to mint, passes to foster guild emergence, the aim to lock tokens to reduce circulating supply and support token prices, days. As long as there aren't any major guilds besides Grand Angle Mata, holding over $2 million in assets, this mechanism is very bullish because many players have their mint passes. This will likely drive the price up, but in the long run, once GAM has three or four big competitors with millions of dollars in assets, players won't appreciate the joke as the token yield will have slipped from their grasp, controlled by an oligopoly of which I'll be a part. This is akin to what happens with commercial banks. The central bank pays out a 4% yield on deposits in the USA today, but when individuals deposit their savings, they don't see a penny of it because the yield has been monopolized by commercial banks. So yes, in the short term it's bullish, and yes, it ensures that the token is locked by a large number of players needing their SR, but in the long term, in a year, two years or whenever the mint passes concentrate into an oligopoly it'll become a problem and i'd bet there'll be a need to backtrack sure maybe this only concerns me right now since everyone's benefiting at the moment but what can i say i have a thing for elegant economic and financial designs anyway it's fixable there'll be a lot of noise but if the small voices shout loud enough at the big ones the team can backtrack especially if there's a pool that allows mint pass yields to leak to token holders so, to me, it's a blemish, but not a disaster. It's just that it could create unnecessary tension between the big and the small due to a fundamental design issue. Alright, I'm done venting. To give you the full picture, I should talk about the entire game economy that revolves around tricell and the valuable resources that can be collected in Arise because, of course, these resources are tied to the project's economy. However, there's not enough information available yet to discuss this in detail, so we'll revisit it later. Regarding GA Meta News, we're discontinuing the non-fungible token newsletter. Why? Because fundamentally I feel that Web3 projects are far from finding truly consistent models. The thing in Web3 is that everyone wants to make money. There are hardly any players who pay just for the sake of playing. So I believe there will be some tough times ahead. And as we're coming to the end of the first year of the newsletter in a bullish market, those who have read and followed us are in the green on our recommendations. So congratulations to everyone. And it's an ideal time to end the newsletter. Right now, Cross the Ages is the only Web3 gaming project I believe in because I understand its economic and financial model direction. That's why we'll be promoting our shop gam-market.com, on GA Meta, which allows buying and selling cards, awakenings, and setting up our little tri-sell marketplace ahead of time. As I trust the fundamentals of this great project, we're working on some cool projects around Cross the Ages that we'll talk about soon. Finally, regarding the CTA token listing, I'll wrap up this video with a clear message. As I've mentioned a long time ago, over a year, I had access to the token presale at 13 cents and also bought loads of tokens through the game with the premium packs we purchased for Arkle Stones and directly at 50 cents through the game interface for a year to fill our accounts and drop as many SRs as possible because I knew they had to hold value. To give you an idea, we currently value Arkle Stones, my investment company, at over $2 million in all sorts of Cross the Ages assets. Cards, mint passes, tokens, souvenir cards, and more. The GA Mita and Arkle Stones project has evolved significantly, but as early as January 2023, 
I explained that there was entrepreneurial potential in the worlds of Artelium. I'm sharing this to tell you that the CTA token is the main currency I hold. I don't have Bitcoin because I mine them and sell them to buy machines or power farms. I have very few dollars or Swiss francs because these currencies yield peanuts compared to the CTA token. I keep a little for groceries, but my savings are mainly in company shares and I don't keep cash because, as Ray Dalio, the major financier behind Bridgewater says, cash is trash. In reality, the only currency I hold for its own sake is the CTA token because it gives me SR cards which I now know I can valorize in securing my lands, which are essentially power farms in the end. That's how much I believe in Cross the Ages. However, yes, I'll be doing some arbitrage when the token gets listed, because if there are investors out there who can't do the math and want to buy my tokens at $1.10, they can have them. Things have their value. And when I see the Alluvium token went up to $1,800, valuing the token at something like $15 billion, I would have sold it a long time ago at those prices. Just because the project is interesting doesn't mean the price doesn't matter. If someone shows up at your door offering to buy your house for $10 million, it would be pretty foolish not to sell. However, I'll always hold enough tokens to fulfill my mint passes because my goal with Arkle Stones and Grand Angle Meta is to build a healthy and sustainable business. So yes, the CTA token is the only token I know of that's credible as a Web3 currency for a metaverse. But take it easy and only invest what you can afford to lose. To understand the workings of a real economy in the reverse of Cross the Ages in more detail, check out this video where I explain why I created an investment company with $1.5 million in CTA assets. It'll give you a good idea of why I'm so excited about this project and how you can find ways to participate in the economy of the Artelium worlds at your own scale.